I'm Gary Schaefer, Director of Glendale Library Arts and Culture. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program, an introduction to the conflict in Artsakh, which is hosted by Niche Academy. Uh, tonight, I'm joined by Dr. Shushon uh, Garapetian. Uh, she is the Deputy Director of the USC Dornsife Armenian Institute, where she leads the Institute's Armenian Studies, Research, and Scholarship Initiatives. Through her work, she focuses on deepening the integration with entities both on and off campus, while also expanding the scope of academic programming. She received her PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures from UCLA in 2014. Uh, while at UCLA, she taught Armenian Studies courses for 10 years and served as Associate Director of the National Heritage Language Resource Center. Uh, Shushan uh, re researches, teaches, and writes about the Armenian experience. Her scholarship focuses on competing ideologies at the intersection of language and the construction of transnational identity. Uh, just uh, for our audience at home, uh, this will last about one hour. Uh, we plan to wrap up at 7.30. Uh, we'll break at 7.15 to 7.20. Uh, for questions. So if our viewers have questions, please submit them in the question box. And please do that before we start and get to the questions. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Shushon, uh, so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm looking forward to our conversation and the opportunity for all of us to learn more about the conflict in Artsakh. So to, to get us started, I know this is a complex conflict with origins going back decades, probably more, and we're going to discuss the history and context, but how would you encapsulate the conflict in Artsakh right now in a few sentences? Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm also very excited for this conversation. Um, it's hard to do that in a couple of sentences, but I'm going to try very hard. I think off the top, it's important to keep in mind that this conflict is directly related to a history of empires, colonialism, and nationalism. And this century-long conflict is the outcome of imposed solutions, which you know we knew this earlier on and we're learning again. The cautionary note is that imposed solutions don't lead to lasting peace. Um, basically, the imperialist nationalist ambitions of Russia and Turkey uh, at the onset of the 20th century, right after World War I, led to trade-offs and a, a kind of gerrymandering that placed majority Armenian populated autonomous regions, not within the new Soviet Republic of Armenia, but within the new Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan. And since then, the Armenians of that region have pushed for self-determination in the face of violations of their human, social, cultural rights, and we can talk about that later. And the response from the Azerbaijani side has been violence and military attacks. And two bloody wars later, we now have a Russian brokered ceasefire, again, an imposed solution, <laughs> um, in the wake of a major humanitarian and refugee crisis and of course, existential angst for the Armenians. Um, so it's so tough, but um, for those in the audience, maybe with less of a background on the region, can you give us a bit of a snapshot of the region, the size, the allies, resources available both to Artsakh as well as Azerbaijan? So Armenia and Azerbaijan, along with Georgia, are located in the South Caucasus. Um, which, as the name implies, is in the vicinity of the Southern Caucasus Mountains, really on the border of Eastern Europe and Western Asia. It's where they meet. Um, let's start with Artsakh or Karabakh, and we'll talk about the name, um, I'm sure. Um, it's a landlocked, de facto independent state with a population, I guess, with a population that was 150,000. Uh, three quarters of the population has now been displaced. Um, and it's a mountainous region with deep valleys. And you know, geography plays a role. That's why there's always been kind of semi-autonomous status there. It's hard mm -hmm. to occupy mountainous territories. Um, the main guarantor of Artsakh's security is the Republic of Armenia. Mm -hmm. um, Armenia, and I'm sure most of the audience here knows to some degree, is a landlocked democratic country. You know, two years ago, we had the peaceful Velvet Revolution. 
The Economist named Armenia country of the year, uh, but it's in a very tough authoritarian neighborhood with Turkey to the west, Georgia to the north, Azerbaijan to the east, all under the imposing presence of Russia. Um, mm -hmm. But what Armenia lacks in resources or size, it makes up in history and culture with a history longer than most European countries. Um, it's home to one of the earliest Christian civilizations with churches founded in the fourth century, thousands of cultural heritage monuments all over this region. Um, the Republic of Armenia encompasses a, an area of about 11,500 square miles and a population of 3 million. Um, now, in terms of if Armenia is the guarantor of Artsakh's security, Armenia has a security alliance with Russia through the Collective Security Treaty Organization. But it's important to keep in mind that that only pertains to the territory of the Republic of Armenia, not Artsakh. Mm -hmm. So the treaty would be triggered if the territory of the Republic were attacked. So that's, um, I think, important to clarify. Um, and of course, there's the diaspora right this worldwide global armenian diaspora that's there with both financial involvement and and resources and skills and so on and and again we can talk about that azerbaijan is a petro state that really has redefined itself over the past two decades from kind of a fledgling independent state in the 90s to a major regional player it has deals with international energy producers and and it's kind of oil and gas resources have allowed it to fill its coffers and rebuild its army. Um, but despite its wealth and increased, increased influence in the wider region, there's lots of poverty and corruption that really overshadow the country's development. There's a strong record of government crackdowns on human rights advocates and journalists. I mean, we witnessed this during the war. If anyone spoke against this kind of state machine, they were immediately um, shut down. Um, and in terms of size, Azerbaijan is three times the size of Armenia with a population of about 10 million. Um, and, and something that's different, and again, we'll talk about this this time around because there was a first war in the 90s, is kind of the direct involvement of Turkey, politically, militarily. Um, and Turkey and Azerbaijan share ethno-linguistic roots. Um, and, and you know, Turkey has a population of 80 million um with our resources and so on but again with a very autocratic leader in president Erdogan and Turkey like Azerbaijan has a struggling economy with a very poor record on human rights and media freedom so I don't think it's an accident that this war came just in time to kind of buff up you know uh support for, for um, the leadership. So those are kind of the major players here. And of course, we'll talk about Russia. Um, well, and uh, I mean, I know you'll, you'll touch on it, but you know, the, the prime minister of Turkey has made no, you know, he has not minced words or tried to act yeah. as if this is, so anyway, I'm, you're more the expert yeah. on that yeah. than me. Yeah. Um, so, so where in the history would you recommend we start when we're trying to understand this current conflict? So let's go back a hundred years. We can go thousands, but <laughs> let's yeah. just go to the last hundred. Um, so this is really post-World War I, Russian Revolution. The Russian Empire has now collapsed. The Bolsheviks are in power and they're trying to convince uh, the kind of new independent republics of Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia to join the Soviet Union. And what happens is that really this kind of gerrymandering of, okay, we'll give this autonomous Armenian populated indigenous Armenian enclave to Azerbaijan, one, to convince them to join, two, to placate now the new Turkish Kemalist state that seems to have pro-socialist attitudes. That this was really, I mean, you know, historians have kind of two worldviews. One was that this was very predetermined, manipulative, you know, divide and conquer on behalf of the Bolshevik leaders. But there's a second group that says, really it was kind of looking at the events on the ground. If this benefited their problems or, solutions to their immediate problems, that's what they did. So really, again, 
this is early 1920s when um, the Bolshevik Soviet leadership decides to take this obviously Armenian majority, at that point it was 95% Armenian populated enclave, and place it within the new Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan, and then after lots of complaints and resistance, give it a kind of autonomous status. And, and you know, we can talk about what that meant. But mm -hmm. so we're thinking, you know, 100 years ago, kind of at the, really the birth of the Soviet Union, um, you know, which was an empire of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, uh, all right, uh, there's so much I <laughs> want to ask. Yeah. Um, but um, so Artsakh is also known as uh, nagorno uh, Karabakh. What is the history of the names of these regions? For, because yeah, our, I, our viewers are seeing, you know, both and kind of interchange in the mm -hmm. news. We actually got this question so many times. I did a podcast interview, uh, <laughs> an episode on this pr precise subject, you know, what's in a name? So Artsakh is the historic Armenian name for this area. And, you know, the first record of it is like 189 BC in one of the Armenian kingdoms. And it's recorded as one of the provinces of the Armenian kingdom. The etymology is not very clear, and I'm someone who's obsessed with language. You know, mm -hmm. I did my digging. Mm -hmm. um, but so this is kind of the the autochthonous name for this area. Um, and then in about the 14th century, we start, especially in Persian records, we start, you know, having this variation of Karabakh, Karabakh. Um, and the most accepted etymology is a Persian Turkic one, meaning black garden. Mm -hmm. There are some other theories, and you know, we don't have to go into that, but really starting from the 14th, 14th century, we have the use of this term, Ghadabagh. Um, and mind you, along this, you know, 14th, 15th centuries, the place is also known as Ahvang. Aran, Khachen. So it's not even just Artsakh and Radabakh. We have uh, multiple names. And then uh, once the Russians come into the show, you, you get this variation Nagorno or Nagorni Radabakh. And Nagorno in Russian means mountainous. Uh -huh. And now we have the Armenian version, Lernain Radabakh. Lernain means mountainous. And even in the transliteration, you'll see because the Russian doesn't have the G sound, instead of it being GH, you have KH, Karabakh, to kind of uh, please the Russian phonetic palate. Um, and a lot of people ask. And then, you know, in the last maybe half century, even in the 80s, when um, the Karabakh movement started in Soviet Armenia, Armenians were very familiar and comfortable with Karabakh, but these kind of nationalist sentiments now brought back the ancient Armenian name, mm -hmm. Artsakh. Um, now in the constitution of the Republic of Artsakh, you have this line that says, you know, it shall be named the Republic of Artsakh, which is equal to the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh. And the, the, the kind of logic behind that is that the international community knows it as Nagorno-Karabakh. So when, for example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs starts publishing information that says Artsakh, no one can search that. Uh, Everyone's going to be searching Karabakh. So now both names are equal, equally used, um, but with different sentiments, of course. One is kind of a native name, one is an imposed name, so. Mm -hmm. So, so under the USSR, was was this um, area like was it its own? Ob is it an oblast? Oblast, right? Oblast. So, oblast. yeah, it was known as the, the Nagorno Karabakh Autonomous Oblast. So, uh -huh. N K A O, um, and oblast is a Russian word meaning province or region. But in the context of the Soviet Union, this was an administrative union. Uh, a, a, I'm sorry, an administrative unit. So the Soviet system had this very interesting hierarchy of administrative divisions. So at the top was, you know, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So Armenia was one, Azerbaijan was one. And within each Soviet Socialist Republic, you could have an autonomous republic, you could have an autonomous oblast, and then just the noblest without the autonomous status. And all of these had varying degrees of status. So 
Nagorno-Karabakh was an autonomous oblast within its kind of parent state of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan. Okay. Um, so, and then that begs the natural question, how does what happened during the fall of the Soviet Union kind of connect with this conflict now? So basically for the 70 years of Soviet rule, you know, some people have the, the kind of impression that all of a sudden this broke out in the 80s, you know, out of nowhere. It didn't come out of nowhere. For 70 years, the Armenians of Karabakh, Artsakh, wrote letters to Moscow complaining about violations of their cultural rights, social rights. So, for example, um, you couldn't study Armenian history if you were a, a president of Karabakh. You had to study Azerbaijani history. You were not allowed to watch Armenian TV. You had no access to Armenian publications. If you were a child in school, you had to choose the Azerbaijani school, which on both sides was not going to be acceptable, the Armenian school where you were studying Azerbaijani history and the Russian school. Those were your choices. Um, you know, the deputy foreign minister of Artsakh was giving an interview at our institute. And she said when she was in her early teens, she went to kind of a all Soviet, pan-Soviet cultural um, event. And she saw the representatives from the Republic of Armenia dancing an Armenian traditional dance. And she realized she, she didn't know what that was. She had never been exposed to Armenian holidays, to Armenian dances, to Armenian folklore, none of it. So kind of on the cultural, psychological level, also on the economic level. Um, economically, they were disadvantaged. Um, infrastructure was not focused in Karabakh, but more so, uh, you know, in Azerbaijan. So there was lots of problems. And there was almost once a decade, the Armenians communicated to Moscow saying, we're not happy with our status. Our rights are not supported. You know, please do something. And then in, in, in the 80s, interestingly enough, it all started with uh, protests for environmental protections. Um, and mind you, protests in the Soviet Union you, you don't protest in the Soviet Union. <laughs> so all of a sudden, a group of you know, Armenians started protesting in Karabakh in the capital, and then Armenians in Armenia start protesting. Um, and these are peaceful protests that kind of now spur the disentanglement of the Soviet Union because you know Gorbachev had just come into power, had put out these ideas of glasnost and perestroika, so openness and reconstruction, and Armenians said, okay, you want openness? We have issues. <laughs> hear us out. And really, they just wanted to be heard. They wanted their issues to be heard. But the response was violence, both from the Republic of Azerbaijan and from the Soviet leadership. Uh, it led to you know, massacres, pogroms. Uh, and interestingly enough, not only in Karabakh, but in other major cities in Azerbaijan, so in Baku and Sumgait, um, and led to a, a bloody war that, that um, lasted a couple of years with almost a million refugees on both sides, 300,000 on the Armenian side, 600,000 on the Azerbaijani side, and you know, a territorial loss for Azerbaijan. Um, and you know, since 1994, there had been a self-administered ceasefire, but not a lasting resolution or a peace agreement. So that does then beg the question, what makes these like current hostilities different from previous conflicts? And then how is it similar to the fighting in the 1990s? So it's not like there weren't skirmishes or flare ups in the last 25 years, there were, but never into a full scale war. The closest was in 2016, we had a four day, four -day war in April. But what's so different this time around is one, the sophisticated technology and weaponry. So on September 27th, Azerbaijani artillery launched an unprecedented attack and there were missiles and drones hitting sites throughout Karabakh. I think just really the region and probably most of the world hadn't seen a, a war with this type of sophistication. So one, that's different. The, the level of kind of military sophistication. Um, two, if in the 90s, this was a war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, that's no longer the case. 
this time around, this is a war between, you know, Artsakh with Armenia as its security guarantor and Azerbaijan with full support from Turkey, military and political. And Turkey now is providing mercenaries from the Middle East. So not only arms, weapons, military knowledge with you know their generals and Ministry of Defense showing up, but also mercenaries, um, which completely, completely um, changes the game. Um, and then of course, weapons from all kinds of countries to the point that um, in the last days of the war, uh, the Armenian leadership was saying, you know, Artsakh and Armenia are fighting against about eight states, um, if you kind of count. So I think, and, you know, we can talk about how the, the Turkish presence turned this into something else, given the history of Armenians and Turkey. That obviously shifted things, because in the 90s, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan were both Soviet states. Yes, everyone was aware that Azerbaijanis have a kind of an ethno-linguistic connection with Turks, but this really kind of brought it to the forefront. And I think the other thing that's important to consider is that for the last 25 years, both Armenia and Azerbaijan, but more so I think on the Azerbaijani side, they've invested their national identity on this conflict. So in the 90s, the, the kind of shame and humiliation of losing the war for Azerbaijan really focused all their efforts on regaining this kind of territory. And that was one, of course, financially building up the military, but also the, the national narrative. So, you know, children in school, like elementary age children are taught that Armenians are your enemy, that, you know, we're going to... So this kind of dehumanization, you know, defining oneself by the other, by the enemy. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's also quite different because in the 90s, these people had coexisted, not on equal terms, but they had coexisted. They had been, there were Azerbaijanis in Armenia and Armenians in Azerbaijan. Um, but that kind of, that has changed. That's been a very, very big turn. Um... So you had kind of alluded to this earlier, but can you explain the history of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's, uh, often called the Minsk Group, and their current role? So the OSC Minsk Group is the only internationally agreed body that is mandated with the task to mediate the negotiations for a peaceful resolution. And I'm emphasizing mediate because you know, um, our director, Salty Razadian, was interviewing one of the former um, MINS co-chairs. And, you know, people constantly turn to them and, and uh, you know, are frustrated. You guys had 25 years. Why didn't you solve this? Why did we have to go to a second war? And he said, we're mediators, not arbiters. We were assigned to mediate, which means we were, our goal was to get the two sides to agree on a settlement, not an imposed one. And again, you know, we started with imposed solutions and, and I kind of want to bring that home. So basically the OSCE is the world's largest security organization with 57 member states. And it, it kind of came into existence in the 1970s and the detente years uh, of the Cold War. And the goal was to have a multilateral forum for dialogue and negotiation between East and West. And in, in 1994, at their Budapest summit, they established this Minsk group with a mandate to provide a framework for conflict resolution um, in you know, assuring the negotiation process to solve this particular conflict. And they have 11 members, but three co-chairs. And the co-chairs have been Russia, France, and the US. And in the 25 years of this process of conflict resolution and negotiation, they've focused on four key elements. One is the security of the people of Gharabakh, so their you know, physical security, cultural, economic, the situation of the million refugees, both Armenian and Azerbaijani, the territories that came under Armenian control during the first war, and the status, most importantly, the status of Gharabakh. What will be the status of Gharabakh? Um, so these were basically the terms that they were trying to get the two sides to hash out and agree to. And unfortunately, 
um, they didn't. And it, you know, Azerbaijan's answer was a military solution. Sorry, it's just never this. It's never the right solution. No. Um, so now, what what has life been like for the people of Artsakh in the last thirty years, uh, living in an unrecognized state? Uh, what does the day to day reality of that look like before, during, and now after the fighting has ceased? Yeah, I don't think you know people think about this. Even when maybe like we can start with during the war. So here you have war crimes which are being commuted, uh, committed, human rights violations, humanitarian crises, and no human rights organization will recognize them because Artsakh is an unrecognized state. And it's, you know, the, the ombudsman of Artsakh kept saying, who by the way is blind because as a child during the first war, he had something blow up in his face, a mine, that was a leftover. And he said, I may be blind, but the international community shouldn't be blind. Just because we live in an unrecognized state doesn't mean we're not human beings. So just, you know, this concept that you are not viewed as a human being worthy of human rights if the state you live in is not recognized. So that's kind of been a very, very strange experience for the people of Artsakh, as if the world really is blind to them, to their existence, to their pain, to their suffering. So that's been very, very difficult, I think, for the people of Artsakh, Armenia, and, and kind of the global diaspora, but even before the war. So let's say you graduated from the State University of Artsakh. You have, you know, 4.0 GPA, you're a stellar student, you wanna study abroad. No country recognizes your degree. <laughs> because the country doesn't recognize your state. <laughs> or let's say you had a surgery, a medical condition that was you know, treated at a hospital in Artsakh, and now you need follow-up treatment somewhere else. They may not recognize the paperwork you bring with you from the hospital in Artsakh. So it's, just, it's absurd if you think about it. it it's is. absurd. And, and you know, we, don't, we also don't think about the consequences. So if you're a young person in Artsakh, well, you don't want to go to the Artsakh State University. You don't want to be a doctor at the hospital in Stepanakert. You want to go to Armenia or to Russia or to Europe. So this also leads to kind of, you know, it's an indirect way of pushing Armenians out, mm -hmm. right? So it, it led to, you know, a brain drain where, where all the young, all the successful left, you know, or wanted to leave and you have the elderly. So I think um, it's, it's and, and right now, again, so you have, people who are now IDPs, who are now refugees, who are on their way back home, and they need help. They need help, humanitarian help. They need help rebuilding. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, the international community will wake up and realize that just because these people live in an unrecognized state doesn't mean that they're not human beings deserving of human rights protections. You use the term IDP. What that internationally, dis internationally, dis uh, internally displaced person. Displaced person. Internally so, displaced person. I mean, you started the conversation with, you know, these um, forced, forced borders mm -hmm. or forced. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, any border, as real as we believe a border is, exactly, it's a human invention and imagination. You know, exactly, we're human beings first, residents of states second. So it's just criminal. Um, Absolutely. So we know three attempts at establishing a ceasefire were unsuccessful. And last week, Russia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia negotiated an agreement to end the fighting. And my understanding is that the agreement transfers key areas of Artsakh to Azerbaijan and installs Russian peacekeepers, uh, peacekeeping forces for five years. What else is important to understand about this agreement? Um, one, that this is a ceasefire document and not a peace settlement. Mm -hmm. This is by no means the end deal. Um, what it does first and foremost is it stops the bloodshed. Okay. So that's one. Um, and it states that all hostilities will be stopped, that Armenia and Azerbaijan will remain in their positions as of the signing of the ceasefire. Um, and basically 
it gives a timeline for the return of the previously Armenian controlled territories that are now under Azerbaijani control and, and the rest that will be returned. And it puts 2000 Russian boots on the ground as peacekeepers. So this is no longer a self-maintained ceasefire. This is now an externally imposed Russian ceasefire. Um, the other interesting points that are mentioned is that there will be a new route that connects Armenia to Artsakh mm -hmm. and that there will be a new transit corridor, a land route that connects Nahijevan, which is an Azerbaijani exclave with which it did not share a border to Can you Azerbaijan. That that's very much, I don't know that, I know yeah. Armenians know what that all is, but that is, you know, when you talk about uh, Artsakh being disconnected from Armenia, you mm -hmm. also have a region of Azerbaijan that is closer to Armenia than it is to uh, yeah. Azerbaijan. So actually, Nahijevan was also a historically Armenian region that in this gerrymandering that we talked about in the beginning was also given to um, the Soviet uh, Republic of Azerbaijan. But basically, there's like Nahijevan, if you look on a map, there's Armenia, and then there's Azerbaijan. And there's no land connection between Nahijevan and Azerbaijan. And Nahijevan, very importantly, is connected to Turkey, because you know Armenia also shares a, a, a border with Turkey on the west. So, and this is something that they've wanted for a very long time. This connects Turkey now directly to Azerbaijan, connects Nahijevan to Azerbaijan, all the way to Central Asia, mm -hmm. right? Um, going through Armenian territory. Mm -hmm. So- Can I build my pipeline now? I mean, sorry, but- Right. Worse right. than that, but at the very least. Right. Um, there's mention of displaced people and refugees returning. Um, so there's a lot of things that are not clear. Uh, there's a very tight timeline about what areas need to be returned to Azerbaijan. The other interesting thing is the OSCE is not mentioned once. So if after 25 years of this internationally, you know, mandated group that was trying to resolve this conflict, after this bloody war, you have a ceasefire agreement that does not mention the OSCE. You know, there's mention of exchange of prisoners of war, hostages, bodies of the dead, um, because now we were going to have a a, a major, you know, crisis, like humanitarian crisis in that sense. The couple of things it doesn't address, the status of Karabakh, again, is not addressed. Mm -hmm. The details of the resettlement of these displaced people. Um, so, you know, if, if we're thinking about those four principles that 25 years of diplomacy was trying to figure out, it still doesn't address some of the most important questions. What will be the status of Karabakh and what, whatever's left of Karabakh? Because in addition to the seven territories that had come under Armenian control in the 90s and now are either partially under Azerbaijani control or will be returned, part of Karabakh proper has also during the war been you know, occupied by Azerbaijan. So whatever's left of Karabakh, what will be the status is not clear. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you know, now we need diplomacy to come in and fashion a, an actual peace document. Mm -hmm. So the agreements ended the fighting, as you said, but there are calls for the Armenian prime minister to resign. I believe the foreign minister resigned yes. the other day. Mm -hmm. um, and is the main resistance to this agreement, I'm going to assume, about the ceding of land to Azerbaijan, or is it more? Yes, I think, yes, of course, you know, no population takes loss easily, um, especially, again, populations that have been so invested in, in this. The Turkish involvement really, really changed the dynamics, and, and we can talk about that as well. But I think part of it was how quickly it happened and how little the prime minister had prepared Armenians for this, because 
and, and, you know, you can kind of see it on both sides. As you're in a war, you don't want to tell your people, hey, guys, we're losing. You know, while your soldiers are still fighting, you kind of want to keep morale high. But at the same time, here's a populist leader who came into power with these democratic notions of transparency, transparency, who used to do Facebook Lives every couple of hours, you know, during the revolution. You know, he disappears for a couple of days, and then he signs this ceasefire agreement in the middle of the night puts it on Facebook at like 2 a.m. <laughs> and then does a Facebook Live a couple of hours later instead of kind of a formal address. So I think, you know, people were genuinely angry, genuinely frustrated. But at the same time, there were also opposition forces trying to use this anger, you know, to make a grab for power. So I think those two kind of coincided. Um, and, and right now, even though there's been multiple resignations, I think everyone understands that the most important thing is to maintain stability in Armenia and to focus on caring for the refugees and the displaced um, people. And also, of course, whatever transition is going to happen, it has to happen within the democratic institutions that are so strong in Armenia that this conflict or this loss or this ceasefire cannot endanger the democratic foundation that Armenia has worked so hard to create in this very tough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So you've alluded to this. I mean, maybe there's one person listening that isn't aware of the Armenian genocide, but I've heard many call this a second genocide. And where do you see the similarities and differences between this conflict and the genocide of Armenians in 1915? So for those who may not be aware, in 1915, starting in 1915, the Ottoman Empire committed a premeditated eradication of its Armenian population. And it led to you know, the extermination of a million and a half Armenians um, from the Ottoman Empire. The reason we have this global diaspora all over the world, you know, as an outcome of that. I think what was very terrifying for Armenians all over the world, in Artsakh, in Armenia, in the diaspora, was the threat of genocide. And, and you know, I can kind of go through a couple of markers that, that kind of excavated the ghost of genocide. Mm -hmm. Turkish involvement, obviously. The moment, you know, President Erdogan says, one state, one nation, two states, and we're going to finish what we started 100 years ago. That, I mean, uh, I, I'm, right. I'm horrified. Yeah. Yeah. And, yep. and uh, the things I want to say about that, I just, I can't say. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really, even... Even if you don't think what's happening is genocide, even if you want to define it as ethnic cleansing, right? Not genocide, because those are different things. But when you hear that as an Armenian, as a descendant of a genocide survivor, which your perpetrator denies to this day, and your perpetrator says, hey, Azerbaijan, who is now ethnic cleansing Armenians, I have your back. We're going to finish what we started 100 years ago. What? Admitting what you've been denying forever. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I think that really just shook the Armenian nation. Yeah. On top of that, on top of that discourse. So let's call let's put that at the discourse level. Yeah, this is talk. But then with the talk, you are now seeing war crimes, horrific violence. You are seeing beheadings of prisoners of war. You're seeing mutilations. You are seeing the use of cluster munitions, which are illegal. You, are, you know, even war has rules. Even war has rules. As terrible as war is, there are rules to war. You don't use cluster munitions on civilians. You don't pour white phosphorus on a forest that will make it uninhabitable. So I think the kind of discourse and then the, you know, there's the talk and then there's the walk. Mm -hmm. That just really, really just made this um, unbelievable. I think the Armenian nation was in shock as to, we can't believe this is happening again. 
that the threat of genocide by the same perpetrator or its co-ethnic is happening again. And not only in Artsakh, then you have hate speech, hate crimes, vandalism, death threats in San Francisco at an Armenian school, in Lyon, in France, there's you know, hordes of cars with Turkish fly, uh, flags with them kind of in a loudspeaker saying, you dogs, you Armenians come out, we're here to get you. So this really, I think this kind of dehumanization of Armenians and this insemination of hate, um, it, it just, you know, and, and on, on top of this, you have now, you have a history of destruction of cultural and religious heritage, both right. in Turkey and in Azerbaijan. This has been well documented. So that exclave that we were talking about, Nahijevan, mm -hmm. had so many cultural heritage sites. So Khachkars, Armenian cross stones, monasteries. You had gravestones, a series of these remarkable gravestones that were a UNESCO heritage site that have now been completely destroyed. These have been documented. So this is not news. So when you see a church, Razan Chetsots, in Shushi being bombed twice in the same day, you know this is not an accident. No. Um, and I think the, the, the denial of it all, the denial of the initial genocide, the denial of any of the war, war crimes or violations that have happened, any of the, you know, both ethnic cleansing and cultural cleansing, heritage cleansing. Um, and you know what's funny, Gary, at the end of it all, so for 25 years, Azerbaijani leadership has said, Armenians, we're welcoming you. You should just stop this call for self-determination and just accept your status as Azerbaijani citizens, right? As part of a we, you should feel safe here. And then the answer to this is all of this, right? So violence and, and, and war and ethnic cleansing and cultural cleansing. So in what logic? Should right. an Armenian now feel safe to live under Azerbaijan? Well, and then my thing was just, you know, it's one thing for some random Turkish person to say those things. Mm -hmm. but this is mm -hmm. the leader of yep. an 8 million population yep. country. I mean, I I don't know. I just, yeah. um, so how, I'm going to try and bring, bring yeah, it down yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about, let, I'd love to talk about the international response um, or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. But how do you rate the US and in international media coverage of the conflict? Um, obviously, I think everybody would have been happier with more coverage. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know. Um, that's that. But whatever coverage there was, the frustration on, I think, Armenians' behalf was that in the beginning, there was this sense of false equivalency. So, for example, you would read headlines that conflict has erupted, this like third person passive, it erupted on its own. This frozen, yeah, this frozen conflict from 100 years ago is smoldering all of a sudden. You know, so you know, it, it's been clear that Azerbaijan was the aggressor, but to put it in these kind of, well, you know, this has been a conflict that's been going on for a long time. It's erupted all of a sudden again. I think that really angered um, a lot of Armenians and to the point that um, this anthropologist, Tamas Shirinyan, wrote this amazing piece saying, look, there's been this push towards neutrality on behalf of US and kind of Western journalists you know, presenting all sides, showing both sides. But when you have crimes committed, you don't ask the victim and the perpetrator for both their sides and say, look, everybody has a perspective, <laughs> right? Sometimes you have to call it out. Mm -hmm. So I think that was frustrating. And I think Armenians, uh, both in Armenia, Artsakh and the diaspora really made a push for accurate coverage, for fair coverage. To some degree, it worked. To some degree, it didn't because... Azerbaijan for 25 years had invested its oil money in hiring lobbying and PR companies that would push their messaging. So, you know, you read a New York Times article 
and you can see it's very kind of shift the shift is on the Azerbaijani perspective where it's citing President Aliyev as if what he says you know is just proof of fact and then you go down and you see the author's name and then you google the name and you see that she works for a PR company that's hired by <laughs> uh, so you know oil money so I think that kind of petrol funds uh, fueling media coverage was very very um frustrating the other thing is you have Western journalists who are not familiar with the geography, who are not familiar with the geopolitical context, who are not familiar with the history of this conflict, who will parachute in, write some sensational story, and then leave. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not fair either, right? If you're going to write a story, you better do your homework. Um, so that's that's been very, very frustrating, especially since from the very beginning, we all realized that this is a war on two fronts. This is a war in the military front and an information war alongside with it. So speaking of information wars um, and fake news or whatever, how have mm -hmm. you found reliable, credible news sources to stay informed on the conflict, giving these competing narratives that you refer to? Mm -hmm from Azerbaijan, Turkey, Armenia, and Artsakh. So I've tried, I personally have tried to stay away from social media, okay. both during and after the war, because it's just, it's very sensationalized. It's very decontextualized. Um, for anyone who wants credible sources, I think one, make sure the source you're looking at is a legitimate source and even legitimate sources that you're used to, you need to vet the writers. Um, interestingly enough, the Russian coverage has been the most in-depth and contextualized because you have had Russian journalists on the ground the entire time who are very familiar with the geopolitical context. Um, and for example, you have Russia today that has coverage in both Russian and English. Mm -hmm. um, the other interesting thing is that Armenia would allow all journalists to come. So any international journalist who wanted to come could come to Armenia, go to the south to Goris, and then they would kind of be escorted to Stepanakis. Azerbaijan did not allow international journalists, or if it did, if, for example, you as a journalist had been to Armenia, you weren't allowed to go to Azerbaijan anymore. So um, that was interesting. But, you know, just again, very, very careful to vet your sources. You know, I follow, for example, you know, the Russian news, but also like civilnet.am provides round the clock updates in Armenian and English and several other languages, Russian, French. Um, I think whatever you're doing, make sure you have context, make sure you're not reading some kind of sensationalized, I guess that's the word, sensationalized. And by no means am I saying that what's happening is not sensational, that by no means am I diminishing the gravity. But I think you want to make sure that the emphasis is on the right things. Okay. So I just, um, I had wanted to say, and I guess I'll announce it later, but the yeah. library actually offers access uh, via a product called Press Reader that people can download in the App Store, put in their library card number, and can read Aravat from Yerevan. Uh, it's published five times a week. LA Times, I was just trying to look quickly. There's several Russian newspapers. I was trying to see if we had the ones you mm -hmm. mentioned, but um, you know, hundreds of newspapers mm -hmm. and magazines. So hopefully I'll, I'll have more information on that at the, at the end. Um, one last question for us, and then we can go to the audience. Um, you know, many people in the Glendale community have strong ties to Armenia and Artsakh and they're struggling right now. Um, for those, I'm many of my colleagues, uh, for those of us who are not personally impacted by the conflict, uh, how would you recommend supporting those who are struggling? Um, one, just on a basic human level, reach out to people. I've, I've been telling my non-Armenian friends who have Armenian friends, just reach out and say, hey, I'm seeing these things happening in the news. Are you okay? Are your family members being deployed? Do you have, you know, wounded or killed soldiers in your network? How are you doing? I think really, and also saying, can you explain what's going on? 
there's no shame in not knowing. Most of us don't know every conflict in the world. You mm -hmm. know, even Armenians, a lot of my Armenian students at USC and UCLA have reached out saying, all of a sudden I realized, I thought I knew Armenian history, but I don't. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and kind of this sense of, if I know more, I'll have more agency. So mm -hmm. I think one, just reaching out to people, asking questions, two, you know, getting informed, um, three, right now, there is a major humanitarian crisis. There are hundreds of thousands of displaced people who either don't have a home to go back to because that territory doesn't exist anymore, it's no longer under Armenian control, or whose homes have been shelled, who have no job to go back to. So these people need help. And whether that's in the form of a donation to you know, an Armenian organization, whether that's in the form of skills or resources any help is is important but so you know kind of that moral support and acknowledgement i think again this goes back to you know 100 years of denial that has fed this need for acknowledgement that hey this happened this happened this happened to my ancestors i remember and you know i'll, I'll finish with this so we can um get to the questions but there was a Canadian Armenian filmmaker who uh, maybe a decade or two ago was trying to find the last survivors of the Armenian genocide. And by the time he got to the handful that he had found, some of them had died already, but he found one. And he asked her this long question saying, um, what does it make you feel like when you hear that the Turkish state denies the genocide? And she said, I don't understand your question. Because <laughs> she had just spent 45 minutes to an hour telling the life story of how she survived the genocide. And she said, I don't understand what you're asking me because what you're asking means my life didn't take place, what I just told you. So I think that angst of like that need for acknowledgement that something is happening. And, you know, whether you have, or I think from an Armenian perspective, whether you have family who's directly impacted by the war or not, this is impacting you as an Armenian. So I think that's important to acknowledge that psychologically, this is impacting all of us. And to have that compassion for someone who, Absolutely. you know, they have to like, they have to show up to their job and do their work and Absolutely. cut people some slack. So, um, so, yeah. so thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll take some audience questions. I'm actually gonna, uh, my colleague, I believe Nicole um, is gonna tag team and she's gonna um, share some of the audience questions with you. Yes, hello. Thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. I've learned a lot and um, judging from the questions that we have, I think um, our uh, uh, attendees are really appreciating it as well. One of the, the qu various themes on this question has come up. Why is it that Artsakh hasn't been recognized internationally? And it, adding into that, why hasn't the um, international community acted more. A lot of questions about, um, uh, you know, the um, the lack of recognition and the 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 lack of action at the um, international level. So it's an excellent question, of course, because it's at the crux of the problem. When the Soviet Union disintegrated the international community had to decide, well, how do we define the borders of now these countries that are coming out of the Soviet Union? Because, you know, in the 70 years of the Soviet Union, all of these countries, yes, they had borders, but they were part of one larger state. But now that the Soviet Union collapsed, all of these individual constituent republics now became independent republics. And you know, we talked about all of those administrative divisions, right? You could have an autonomous republic within a Soviet socialist republic and then an autonomous province and then a province. So what's what was gonna happen with all of those? And interestingly enough, we didn't mention this in the conversation, in the late 80s, when this kind of, the protest started for Gharabagh, the people of Gharabagh held a referendum that was within the legal framework of the Soviet Union because you could choose to hold a referendum and stay as part of the Soviet Union or you know become independent and within that legal framework they held a referendum and overwhelmingly voted to join Armenia which the Soviet Union did not allow 
And so when the Soviet Union disintegrated, the international community recognized the boundaries that used to be present in the Soviet Union. So Karabakh was part of Azerbaijan during the Soviet Union. So the international community recognized the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan's boundaries. So really, this was the problem, even though the people of Artsakh, the people of Karabakh, had voted <laughs> to not be part of Azerbaijan and had declared their independence actually before Azerbaijan declared its independence from the Soviet Union. So the argument from you know, the Artsakh's perspective is we were never part of independent Azerbaijan. They didn't ask us in the early 1920s if we wanted to be part of Azerbaijan, nor did we agree to be part of independent Azerbaijan. But unfortunately, the international community respects and accepts the territorial integrity of the state of Azerbaijan. Another question that's come up a couple of times is, why hasn't Armenia uh, recognized uh, Artsakh as an independent state. A, a number so, of uh, yeah. attendees yeah. have asked. Um, this is, uh, so if Armenia recognizes the independence of Artsakh and no one else does, it doesn't really do much for the status of Artsakh. You know, you need kind of major powers in the world to recognize it uh, uh, for that kind of movement to start. The other thing is because Armenia was one of the parties, right? in this conflict, um, it, it didn't make sense for Armenia to recognize Artsakh because then it would be, it would lose its neutrality in a sense. Um, also, I think in the early years for Armenia to recognize the independence of Artsakh, that would mean kind of declaring uh, a, a, the status of an aggressor and that that was not perhaps kind of geopolitically uh, a, a desirable thing. But long story short, um, you need really a force from the international community. Just Armenia recognizing it wouldn't solve this problem of self-determination. Sure, thank you. Um, I, let's see, and we have a lot of questions coming in and I think I'll, I'll ask one, one more. You kind of touched on this already. Um, uh, well, not the Russia's role in this uh, this period now. How does Russia benefit um, from the current agreement? So, you know, the the um, if this were like a social media post, <laughs> we would say Russia won this war, <laughs> <laughs> Armenia lost, and Azerbaijan is somewhere in between. Uh, Russia benefits by ha having boots on the ground. This is something that Russia has wanted for a very long time. Remember, this territory used to be kind of part of its purview, right? This was its area of the world. This was its backyard, right? So, you know, geopolitically, you have kind of superpowers that have their own backyard. And this used to always be Russia's backyard. And it always wanted that. And also, um, all throughout this conflict, Russia had, you know, was selling weapons both to Azerbaijan and to Armenia. It mm -hmm. it always liked keeping this conflict kind of unresolved because it was the one controlling which direction it went. Um, so I think having Russian boots, and you know, when the Russians come, they don't leave. If you look at, you know. Georgia, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, those conflicts, when Russian peacekeepers come in, they don't leave. Um, so to have such a strong presence, I think is, is uh, very beneficial for Russia. Um, let's see, let's see. I think this is an interesting time to see whether or not the West will respond because it's really been pushed out um, and you know, one could say pushed out and, you know, another could say completely absent. Um, I think uh, Armenia looked to the West, looked to the international community and the international community besides a couple of nice lines. So, you know, sorry, we feel bad. This is a terrible thing to happen. Had no leverage, you know, it was just talk. So, so Russia stepped in. 
So Shushan, um, would you, um, we're, we're out of time and we could talk mm -hmm. for hours and hours. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of forward the questions to you and maybe we do blog sure. posts at the library. And I think I'd, I'd like if you could um, perhaps write something up and kind of answer some of the questions we weren't able to get to this evening. But um, most of all, I wanna thank you so much um, for joining us tonight and for sharing your expertise and insight. I think I speak for all the attendees when I say that we're leaving tonight with a deeper and more nuanced understanding of this situation. And our thanks to USC Dornsife Institute of Armenian Studies uh, for partnering with us on this event. The Institute is an amazing resource for information on this conflict and so much more. So please do check out their website at armenian.usc.edu. Um, I wanna thank all of our attendees for joining us. As a reminder, you can access the Armenian language newspaper Aravat uh, from Yerevan, Armenia, as well as the Los Angeles Times, many Russian newspapers and magazines in Russian uh, through uh, the Glenda Library Arts and Culture Department uh, using Press Reader. Just go to glac.info slash Press Reader to learn how to access or download the Press Reader app, select our library and enter your library card number and PIN don't have a library card, our library cards are easier than ever to acquire and they're still free. Um, so just go to glac.info slash register. You can also keep up to date with all of Glendale Library Arts and Culture Services and events by visiting eglendalelac, the library, artsandculture.org. You know, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a pleasant evening and let's hope this resolves in um, a positive way as possible and maybe our work tonight can help you know fuel some more international um, involvement so thank you thank you good night mm -hmm.